Henry Louis Mencken was born in Baltimore in 1880. He was an American journalist and a writer, best known for his polemics, his satire, his essays generally, and his cultural criticism. He admired Nietzsche and opposed organized religion, representative democracy, and the American entry into the world wars. And in his time, it was both harder than it is today to oppose organized religion, and it was easier than it is today to oppose democracy as an institution. It's interesting to think that there was a time when one of the leading journalists in the U.S. openly opposed and criticized democracy as a system, not this or that government, but the entire structure of it. And he sometimes did it in a very funny way. We'll look at some of that. He later described reading Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain when he was nine years old as, quote, the most stupendous event in my life, end quote. And the event led him to read a lot and to become a writer. When he was a bit older, he worked for three years in his father's cigar factory, but he didn't like that work and he made up his mind to quit and do something else. He then took a writing class through a free correspondence school, which as far as I can tell was a kind of distance learning. I suppose he must have been studying by mail. But this one writing class that he took ended up being all of his formal education after high school in journalism and writing or in anything else. But it's clear from his writing that he was very well read. So even thereafter, he continued to read actively, it seems, for the rest of his life, classics as well as the contemporary literature of his time. He got a job first as a reporter at the Baltimore Morning Herald, and he worked there for six years before he moved to the Baltimore Sun in 1906, writing for various editions. And he would write for the Sun until 1948, so for more than 40 years. And it was at the Sun that he began to do the writing that would build his fame. On the side, he wrote poetry, short stories, and a novel. In 1908, he became a critic for the Smart Set magazine, and in 1924, he and a friend founded and edited the American Mercury, which was a magazine that became influential on college campuses. Though in 1933, nine years after they started, Mencken quit that job of editor of that magazine that he had helped to found. In 1930, so when he was about 50 years old, he married Sarah Hart, who was a German-American professor of English and a native of Alabama. And this was surprising both because Mencken had made fun of marriage a lot, and also he had harshly criticized the American South, whereas now not only was he getting married, but he was marrying somebody from Alabama. And she was apparently about 18 years younger than him. He was friends with many of the big American literary figures of that time, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sinclair Lewis, Joseph Hergesheimer, and many others. He also clearly admired Joseph Conrad. Often when he's giving an example of an excellent piece of work, he gives an example from Conrad's writing. Though Conrad was only about 23 years older than Mencken, and he died when Mencken was 44, it appears that they never met. In 1948, Mencken had a stroke that left him fully conscious, but he mostly could not read or write, and he had a hard time speaking. But after the stroke, he often listened to classical music, something that he clearly loved and wrote about often, and he gradually regained the ability to speak and would talk with friends. And during the last year of his life, William Manchester, who was a friend of Mencken's and a significant historian, though about 40 years younger than Mencken, read aloud to him daily. So he loved reading and learning so much that even after he'd had this stroke, he still wanted somebody to read to him. And Henry Louis Mencken died in 1956 in Baltimore, the city of his birth. I found an estimate online that in a career lasting more than 50 years, Mencken had written over 70 million words. And to put that in perspective, there's a typical calculation that in a page of a regular book, there are about 300 words. And if you take a regular book length at about 300 pages, then 70 million words is approximately 777 300-page books. Though another way to look at it is over 50 years, counting 260 working days per year, removing weekends and holidays, it gets you to about 5,400 words per day. And if you've ever tried to write 5,400 words in a day, it's certainly possible, but you would need much of the day to do it. 
it would pretty much have to be your full-time job, the main thing that you were doing that day. And you'd also need to have a pretty clear idea of what you were going to be writing about that day. And one of the things that comes through in the collection of writings that I read is that Mencken was continuously taking notes and generating ideas about what he was going to write about in the future, because toward the end of the collection, he gives some of his raw notes that never turned into an article or a book, and often they're just a half of a sentence or an idea or a thought or a comparison. So we don't know if this figure of 70 million words is anywhere near accurate, but if it is, he probably also had a fairly developed process for generating new ideas so that while he was working on one piece of writing, he had other ideas bubbling up that he was organizing for something that he was going to write next or in the future. So that whenever he sat down to write, he probably already had some idea of what he was going to write about, which for a professional journalist, a professional writer of Mencken's caliber, that's probably to be expected. But also what's interesting about that number of 5,400 words a day is to sustain it over such a long period, though he would have written more at certain times and less at others, but still to maintain something like that pace over such a long time is a major feat also. And Mencken was, of course, doing a certain kind of writing. He was often reacting to current issues of that day, what was going on in what we would today call the news cycle, though he did plenty of writing that was not that, that was literary criticism, that was reflections on history, reflections on music, on art. He wrote about life generally, about men and women, about death, about work, about democracy, as I mentioned. But doing the kind of writing that Kant did, for example, probably couldn't be done at a pace of 5,400 words a day because you would run out of thoughts. You have to do the thinking first and then do the writing. And it's hard to come up with 5,400 words about space and time and intuition and experience and appearances. So I would never say that everybody should emulate this Mencken model of writing, again, assuming that it's even accurate. But even if he didn't write 70 million words, it's clear that he wrote a lot. And one of the things I like about this is this energetic, proactive approach to creative work. And the more I think about that number, the more it seems impossible, because now I'm remembering that he was, of course, doing this without a computer. But I like the approach to writing or painting or composing or whatever it might be that is active rather than passive. It attacks rather than waits. That whatever it is that you're working on, especially if you have the luxury of being somebody who does it full time, you ought to be working on it every day. You shouldn't be lollygagging and wasting time just because your job happens to look a little bit more ethereal from the outside. You shouldn't be doing that any more than you would be if your job was to move boxes around a warehouse. You should be focused on it with the discipline and industry with which you would be doing any other job. And of course, in creative work, that sometimes might mean going and visiting a place. If you're trying to write about a certain place, it might be useful to go and see the place physically. And so, fine, as part of the creative work of writing, that could be part of it. But however many other activities you may have like that, you need to be able to account for your time, whether you're at home working or you're out and about learning something or researching something. And I say this in part because the words used to describe the people who do certain types of creative work carry different amounts of cultural weight as a result of this kind of behavior. What the heck am I talking about? When somebody says that they're a writer or a poet or a visual artist, then most people do not react the same way that they do when the person says that they are a engineering student or a law student or whatever it might be. And I'm thinking of young people, not people who are professionally writers or poets, but somebody who's 22. And when somebody asks them how they like to spend their time, they indicate by writing something. Many people will not take that second type of young person as seriously, or they won't look at them in the same way as the law student. And I don't think that the reason is just because the law student has better prospects for earning money. I think that there is partially a perception that many people who gravitate toward creative work do it because it's less stressful. There's less pressure on it. It's harder to measure. And so it's easier to fake. And the trouble is that they're kind of correct in that it is easier to fake being a poet than it is to fake being an engineering student. To be a real poet, somebody who sits down every day 
and tries really hard to arrange words very carefully and thinks very carefully about the words that they use and the concept that they're trying to articulate and also goes looking for those concepts, trying to find interesting notions to write about, interesting connections, whatever it might be. Somebody like that can be on par with the industry of an engineering student. But it's very easy to say, oh, I'm a poet and to have written three poems and none of them are very good and you didn't think very much about them and you haven't read very much other poetry, but you've written and read more poems than most people have. So you can define yourself this way. You can say, I'm a poet. Being an engineering student isn't like that. You have to work really hard or you flunk out of the program. The minimum is much higher. Now, the maximum of what a poet or a writer can be is, I would argue, at least as high, if not higher than what an engineering student or a law student can be, though saying higher in this case, it's hard to know exactly what we're talking about. So that's not so important. It's enough to say at the higher level, being a writer involves a lot of work and cognitive exertion that's at least comparable with any other field that you could study in a university or anywhere else. The trouble is that the bottom level is not the same. The ticket to entry for being an engineering student is more expensive than that for calling yourself a writer. And this topic is important to me because I have some experience with classical music, and classical music also has a quite high ticket to entry. To be somebody who can play the cello in an orchestra and sound reasonably good takes years and hundreds of hours before you even are tolerable to listen to for any length of time. And when you get to higher levels, everybody in the room has spent thousands of hours and a lot of cognitive and emotional energy on what they do. So when you come out of that environment and you encounter somebody who says, oh, I'm a musician or who postures like a musician on social media, and it's essentially because they own a guitar and have spent a year or two messing around on it, that can be harmful in that it cheapens the work that other musicians have put into what they do. It makes it so other people on the outside view all musicians as the same. They go, this guy has spent 18 months learning the guitar, and this guy has spent 12 years learning to play the clarinet. They're both musicians. I'm going to give them both the same social currency, whatever that's worth, for what they do. That's harmful to the field of people who play the clarinet because they say, why should I do the work? Why not just go do something else if I don't at least get some acknowledgement of what I've done and some proportional social status because... That's a big part of why anybody does anything. Why bother? And it is intensely valuable that people spend a lot of time trying to write well, trying to play the clarinet well, trying to make their art well, whatever it might be. And while it shouldn't, people's outside perception of people doing their art matters to the people doing it. And so this practice of using the same word for somebody who has done a tremendous amount of work in a field and another person who's done a lot less, is harmful to the field as a whole because if fewer people want to go into it, then the field as a whole will degenerate slowly. And by the way, this is not at all to pick on people who play the guitar casually or whatever, do any other thing in a low-key way as a hobby, as something that they do outside of their job, something for fun. Obviously, that's very positive. Anybody who wants to should get into anything that they want to do, play an instrument, do some creative writing, do some painting, whatever it might be. I would never want to discourage those people. The trouble and the reason why I like Mencken's example of being very industrious in his writing, though that might mean that much of it is not very good. I don't know. I read only this one volume. And even if he wrote 70 million words, the total that are still available today is significantly less than that, is that the creative process of writing or whatever it might be sometimes involves some quiet contemplation. In fact, Hopefully it often does. But quiet contemplation is not the same as cruising social media, for example. And when people do not take their own work very seriously, other people outside the field don't take that work very seriously. And then other people who might get into it and contribute to it in a meaningful way are less likely to do so. And in case this sounds like gatekeeping to anybody, I'll say, yes, this is gatekeeping and I'm fine with gatekeeping. Serious fields have gates on them. You don't get to call yourself a mathematician unless you can do some very advanced, complicated math. You don't get to call yourself a pilot unless you can actually fly the plane. And if you happen to still be outside the gate in whatever field that you're in, that's okay too. If you want, you can keep working on it until you pass whatever threshold, or you can keep doing it in a relaxed way and enjoy it that way. That's fine. And if this view somehow seems hurtful to somebody who's outside the gate, which by the way, I don't think that it is, 
everybody who is now advanced in a field was at one point not advanced in it. So everybody had to go through where you are now to get to where they are. But if it seems disrespectful to people who are less advanced in a field, or more importantly, less committed to it, have given less time to it, less energy to it, it is equally respectful to people who are inside the gate. Sacrifice means something, and your claim to something is in proportion to the time and dedication and energy that you have sacrificed in pursuit of that thing. If you've sacrificed more, you have more claim to it. If you've sacrificed less, you have less claim to it. If you want to have more of a claim to something, then give more time and energy to it. And as I said, if you don't care so much about that, then that's fine as well. If the demands of life are such that you can only give so much time to this thing that you enjoy, but you enjoy doing it, that's excellent. It's much better than sitting around watching some stupid TV show than turning into a zombie on social media. So I would never want to discourage anybody from doing whatever side project, side hobby that they have. Doing creative work, even in small amounts, is, I think, very good for a person, very healthy. It's much better than many other things you could do. It makes you feel good. Other people around you can enjoy it. But I think there has to be this demarcation between people who do something in that way and people who give their whole lives to something. Because if society doesn't recognize that greater sacrifice, then fewer people will be willing to make it. Anyway, now we can get into some passages from Christomathy by Henry Louis Mencken, which is one compilation of his writings from many different times on many different topics. Some of it is unpublished notes. Most of it had been published, but maybe was out of print at the time. And he brings it together in different categories. And so it touches on a lot of different topics. And to give you a sense of Mencken's tone and his approach relatively early on, he writes, quote, those who explore the ensuing pages will find them marked by a certain ribaldry, even when they discuss topics commonly regarded as grave. I do not apologize for this, for life in the Republic has always seemed to me to be far more comic than serious. We live in a land of abounding quackeries, and if we do not learn how to laugh, we succumb to the melancholy disease which afflicts the race of viewers with alarm. I have had too good a time of it in this world to go down that chute. I have witnessed in my day the discovery, enthronement, and subsequent collapse of a vast army of uplifters and world savers, and am firmly convinced that all of them were mountebanks. We produce such mountebanks in greater number than any other country, and they climb to heights seldom equaled elsewhere. End quote. And these passages are interesting to read on at least three levels. One is that the thoughts are interesting, the content is interesting. But another is that, on the one hand, these are things that were printed in newspapers in America between something like roughly 1918 and 1948. They're all different dates. And it's honestly interesting sometimes to see what Mencken could get away with or maybe what was ordinary at the time, that you would have a hard time printing in a newspaper today. We have this idea that the past was more constrained in every way than the present, but it's clear from these writings that, in certain ways, journalists in the first half of the 20th century were more free, or at least Mencken was because he had partially built his reputation on being something of an iconoclast. And so he knew that even if his writing made some people mad, it would make other people happy and he would be able to go on doing it. Or maybe he genuinely didn't care if it made people mad and if that threat was not enough of a deterrent to drive him to self-censorship. But the third way in which these are interesting is that since they are a compilation, and it appears that it was published in 1949 after his stroke, so maybe one of the things he did after he stopped writing was at least work on putting his writings together into volumes like this. But you have a guy who wrote a lot of words on a lot of topics, and now he is extracting from those words, those writings... The parts that, looking back on his life, he now thinks are the most valuable. So it's gone through his own filter first. So then we can think a little bit about why did he pick this passage? Why does he like this one? What's the overall message here that he thought maybe summarized a larger section of his writing or his work? Later along similar lines as that first passage, Mencken writes, quote, Man's capacity for abstract thought, which most other mammals seem to lack, has undoubtedly given him his present mastery of the land surface of the earth, a mastery disputed only by several hundred thousand species of insects and microscopic organisms. It is responsible for his feeling of superiority, and under that feeling there is undoubtedly a certain measure of reality, at least within narrow limits. But what is too often overlooked is that the capacity to perform an act is by no means synonymous with its salubrious exercise. The simple fact is that most of man's thinking is stupid, pointless, and injurious to him. Of all animals, indeed, he seems the least capable of arriving at accurate judgments in the matters that most desperately affect his welfare. Try to imagine a rat in the realm of rat ideas, 
arriving at a notion as violently in contempt of plausibility as the notion, say, of Swedenborgianism, or that of homeopathy, or that of infant damnation, or that of mental telepathy. Man's natural instinct, in fact, is never toward what is sound and true, it is toward what is specious and false. Let any great nation of modern times be confronted by two conflicting propositions, the one grounded upon the utmost probability and reasonableness and the other upon the most glaring error, and it will almost invariably embrace the latter. It is so in politics, which consists wholly of a succession of unintelligent crazes, many of them so idiotic that they exist only as battle cries and shibboleths and are not reducible to logical statement at all. It is so in religion, which, like poetry, is simply a concerted effort to deny the most obvious realities. It is so in nearly every field of thought. The ideas that conquer the race most rapidly and arouse the wildest enthusiasm and are held most tenaciously are precisely the ideas that are most insane. This has been true since the first advanced gorilla put on underwear, cultivated a frown, and began his first lecture tour. And it will be so until the high gods, tired of the farce at last, obliterate the race with one great final blast of fire, mustard gas, and streptococci. End quote. Later on the human capacity for finding the truth, he writes, quote, The capacity for discerning the essential truth, in fact, is as rare among men as it is common among crows, bullfrogs, and mackerel. The man who shows it is a man of quite extraordinary quality, perhaps even a man downright diseased. Exhibit a new truth of any natural plausibility before the great masses of men, and not one in ten thousand will suspect its existence, and not one in a hundred thousand will embrace it without a ferocious resistance. All the durable truths that have come into the world within historic times have been opposed as bitterly as if they were so many waves of smallpox, and every individual who has welcomed and advocated them, absolutely without exception, has been denounced and punished as an enemy of the race. Perhaps absolutely without exception goes too far. I substitute with five or six exceptions. But who were the five or six exceptions? I leave you to think of them. Myself, I can't. If truth thus has hard sledding, error is given a loving welcome. The man who invents a new imbecility is hailed gladly and bidden to make himself at home. He is, to the great masses of men, the beau ideal of mankind. Go back through the history of the past thousand years and you will find that nine-tenths of the popular idols of the world, not the heroes of small sects, but the heroes of mankind in the mass, have been hawkers of palpable nonsense. It has been so in politics, it has been so in religion, and it has been so in every other department of human thought. Every such hawker has been opposed, in his time, by critics who denounced and refuted him. His contention has been disposed of as immediately as it was uttered. But on the side of every one there has been the titanic force of human credulity, and it has sufficed in every case to destroy his foes and establish his immortality. End quote. In another passage, he's talking about motive and how the motive of wanting to do good is maybe not as valuable to people as pure curiosity has been. That the functional result of these two motivations are not necessarily what you might intuitively guess that they would be. He writes, quote, The value the world sets upon motives is often grossly unjust and inaccurate. Consider, for example, two of them, merely insatiable curiosity and the desire to do good. The latter is put high above the former, and yet it is the former that moves one of the most useful men the human race has yet produced, the scientific investigator. What actually urges him on is not some Brummagem idea of service, but a boundless, almost pathological thirst to penetrate the unknown, to uncover the secret, to find out what has not been found out before. His prototype is not the liberator releasing slaves, the good Samaritan lifting up the fallen, but a dog sniffing tremendously at an infinite series of rat holes. End quote. And you could take this idea a bit further and say that not only has curiosity perhaps resulted in more good than the desire to do good, but the desire to do good often causes harm. People getting involved in something with the intention of improving it or helping somebody often do succeed in doing so, but they often mess things up quite badly as well. And you could make the argument that curiosity can cause harm, but that's harder to do than you might think. Because if you were to attribute all technological development to curiosity, then you could say, well, the development of nuclear weapons was harmful. It would have been better if we had never known that. And that might be true and it might not be. It's hard to know if without nuclear weapons, might the 20th century have been more violent than it was because 
the Soviet Union and the United States might have gotten into hot wars more often than they would have otherwise, it's hard to make those kinds of measurements. But also, the story of the development of nuclear weapons was not driven by pure curiosity. The development of the physics that made them possible might have been, but the hypothesis that such a weapon using that physics was possible and the project of trying to build it was not primarily motivated by curiosity. One of the thoughts that I had a couple times while reading Mencken was that there are moments where it's like reading Nietzsche if Nietzsche had more of a sense of humor. And most of Mencken is not obviously reflective of Nietzsche, but there are passages that very clearly show his admiration for Nietzsche's ideas, but they're often articulated in a funnier way than Nietzsche would have done. And this next passage isn't particularly funny, but it seems Nietzsche informed to me because Nietzsche sometimes talks about how the bias toward truth, the human preference for truth over falsehood, is something that itself could be examined and questioned. And here, Mencken is not saying the same thing, but there's something here that's in the same zip code as that thought of Nietzsche's. Mencken writes, quote, The man who boasts that he habitually tells the truth is simply a man with no respect for it. It is not a thing to be thrown about loosely, like small change. It is something to be cherished and hoarded and dispersed only when absolutely necessary. The smallest atom of truth represents some man's bitter toil and agony. For every ponderable chunk of it, there is a brave truth-seeker's grave upon some lonely ash dump and a soul roasting in hell." End quote. In this next passage, he's talking about a few different things. He talks about civilization, about men and women, about controlling emotions, and about war. And it's interesting because he thinks that women are better at controlling their emotions than men are, which is contrary to a popular stereotype about men and women. And he also says that civilization is what makes people less able to control their emotions. And it's partially because civilization, and in particular democracy, is always riling people up into a frenzy, that a normal part of the functioning of its politics involves stirring people up in that way. Quote, the capacity for submitting to and prospering comfortably under this cheesemonger's civilization is far more marked in men than in women, and far more in inferior men than in men of the higher categories. It must be obvious to even so pathetic an ass as a college professor of history that very few of the genuinely first-rate men of the race have been wholly civilized in the meaning given to the term in newspapers. Think of Caesar, Bonaparte, Luther, Frederick the Great, Cromwell, Barbarossa, Innocent III, Bolivar, Hannibal, Alexander, and to come down to our time, Grant, Stonewall Jackson, Bismarck, Wagner, and Cecil Rhodes. The fact that women have a greater capacity than men for controlling and concealing their emotions is not an indication that they are more civilized, but a proof that they are less civilized. This capacity is a characteristic of savages, not of civilized men, and its loss is one of the penalties that the race has paid for the tawdry boon of civilization. Your true savage, reserved, dignified, and courteous, knows how to mask his feelings, even in the face of the most desperate assault upon them. Your civilized man is forever yielding to them. Civilization, in fact, grows more and more maudlin and hysterical, and especially under democracy, it tends to degenerate into a mere combat of crazes. The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Wars are no longer waged by the will of superior men capable of judging dispassionately and intelligently the causes behind them and the effects flowing out of them. They are now begun by first throwing a mob into a panic. They are ended only when it has spent its ferine fury. Here, the effect of civilization has been to reduce an art that was once the repository of an exalted etiquette and the chosen avocation of some of the best men of the race to the level of a raid on a fancy house or a fight in a waterfront saloon. All the wars of Christendom are now disgusting and degrading. The conduct of them has passed out of the hands of nobles and knights and into the hands of demagogues, moneylenders, and atrocity mongers. End quote. This next passage is about women and how... For most men, women are the only adventure that they have. But even for a man whose life has a fair amount of adventure in it, women still offer a different kind of adventure. And while civilization has changed a lot of other things, it hasn't changed this very much. He writes, quote, The allurement that women hold out to men is precisely the allurement that Cape Hatteras holds out to sailors. They are enormously dangerous and hence enormously fascinating. 
To the average man, doomed to some banal drudgery all his life long, they are for the only great hazard that he ever encounters. Take them away and his existence would be as flat and secure as that of a moo cow. Even to the unusual man, the adventurous man, the imaginative and romantic man, they offer the adventure of adventures. Civilization tends to dilute and cheapen all other hazards. Even war has been largely reduced to caution and calculation. Already, indeed, it employs almost as many press agents, letter openers, and generals as soldiers. But the duel of sex continues to be fought in the berserker manner. Whoso approaches women still faces the immemorial dangers. Civilization has not made them a bit more safe than they were in Solomon's time. They are still inordinately menacing, and hence inordinately provocative, and hence inordinately charming. End quote. In a passage about Nietzsche, he writes, quote, his furious attack upon the Christian ideal of humility and abnegation has caused Christian critics to denounce him as an advocate of the most brutal egoism. But in point of fact, he proposed only the introduction of a new and more heroic form of renunciation, based upon abounding strength rather than upon hopeless weakness. And in his maxim, be hard, there was just as much sacrifice of immediate gratification to ultimate good as you will find in any of the Principia of Jesus. End quote. In this next one, he's talking about work and the evolution of our perspective of what work is and how we should think about it. And he begins by talking about the Romans and their view, and then he gets into medieval Christianity and their view, and he gets to Martin Luther, that's what this passage is, and argues that Martin Luther deified work in a certain way. He made it so that we think about the work that we have to do every day as something elevated rather than as drudgery. And this one caught my attention because I'm always interested in how certain ideas got into my head. This is a difficult thing to track, but it's worth the time that if you find yourself thinking a thing, even if it's something that apparently makes sense, you should stop and figure out where that idea came from and if it's actually valid and base it on something more sound than having heard some authority figure say it or it being in the culture generally around you or whatever it might be. And trying to examine every component in your thinking is a lot of work, and maybe it's a project that never really ends. But I find the more I do it, the more I'm able to improve and at least know why I think something. But here, Mencken offers one explanation for part of why we think the way that we do about work. And there might be flaws in this, or there might be other components as well. There might be other reasons why we think the way that we do about work. But the historical process that he describes here has almost certainly contributed in some way to how you think about work. Mencken writes, quote, As the Middle Ages flowed into the Renaissance and sustained work became ever more necessary to the well-being of a rapidly changing society, it naturally became more and more virtuous. But the Catholic theologians granted it their approval, one suspects, only under harsh economic compulsion. In their hearts, they apparently still cherished the old Christian view of it as burdensome and painful. And when they praised it roundly, it was chiefly as penance. It remained for the heretic Martin Luther to discover that the thing was laudable in itself. He was the true inventor of the modern doctrine that there is something inherently dignified and praiseworthy about labor. That the man who bears a burden in the heat of the day is somehow more pleasing to God than the man who takes his ease in the shade. Here, as in other directions, he gave an eager theological ratification to the economic revolution that was going on around him and could not be stayed. He was the champion of the new masters of Europe, the bourgeois men of business, against its old masters, the soldiers and priests. These men of business needed willing laborers, and the easiest way to make them willing was to convince them that by working hard they were serving and gratifying God. End quote. And this next passage shows how Mencken was largely what we would today call at least a libertarian, if not some kind of anarchist. But his view of government lines up to a great extent with Nietzsche's. Mencken writes, quote, All government, in its essence, is a conspiracy against the superior man. Its one permanent object is to oppress him and cripple him. If it be aristocratic in organization, then it seeks to protect the man who is superior only in law against the man who is superior in fact. If it be democratic, then it seeks to protect the man who is inferior in every way against both. One of its primary functions is to regiment men by force, to make them as much alike as possible and as dependent upon one another as possible, to search out and combat originality among them. All it can see in an original idea is potential change, and hence an invasion of its prerogatives. The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. 
Almost inevitably, he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane, and intolerable. And so, if he is romantic, he tries to change it. And even if he is not romantic personally, he's very apt to spread discontent among those who are. End quote. In this next passage, he's talking about how governments through history seek to establish legitimacy for themselves, how they build an ideology that supports and protects what they're doing so that people don't oppose it, and how those ideologies are not only untrue, they do the opposite of what they claim to do. It's not that this form of government fails to support this value, it's that this form of government actually opposes it. Quote, In every age, the advocates of the dominant political theory seek to give it dignity by identifying it with whatever contemporaneous desire of man happens to be most powerful. In the days of monarchy, monarchy was depicted as the defender of the faith. In our present era of democracy, democracy is depicted as the only safe guardian of liberty. And the communism or super-communism of tomorrow, I suppose, will be sold to the bourgeoisie as the only true palladium of peace, justice, and plenty. All of these attempts to hook up cause and effect are nonsensical. Monarchy was fundamentally not a defender of the faith at all, but a rival and enemy to the faith. Democracy does not promote liberty, it diminishes and destroys liberty. And communism, as the example of Russia already shows, is not a fountain that gushes peace, justice, and plenty, but a sewer in which they are drowned. End quote. In this next passage, he talks about some of the assumptions that underlie democracy. And one of the things he argues is that democracy was not pushed from the bottom up, but from the top down. That it was thinkers like Rousseau who promoted it, and that ordinary people were not interested in political theory. They wanted concrete things like, he lists, more to eat, less work, higher wages, lower taxes. And you could argue that the mass of people want that, and they don't care too much what form of government will get it for them. And that it was other people who converted this popular desire for concrete things into a desire for a particular form of government. And I'll let him say his part first, and then I'll say a thing or two. Mencken writes, quote, It remains impossible, as it was in the 18th century, to separate the democratic idea from the theory that there is a mystical merit, an esoteric and ineradicable rectitude, in the man at the bottom of the scale, that inferiority by some strange magic, becomes a sort of superiority, nay, the superiority of superiorities, everywhere on earth. Save where the enlightenment of the modern age is confessedly in transient eclipse, the movement is toward the completer and more enamored enfranchisement of the lower orders. Down there, one hears, lies a deep, illimitable reservoir of righteousness and wisdom, unpolluted by the corruption of privilege. What baffles statesmen is to be solved by the people instantly and by a sort of serific intuition. Their yearnings are pure, they alone are capable of a perfect patriotism. In them is the only hope of peace and happiness on this lugubrious ball. The cure for the evils of democracy is more democracy. This notion, as I hint, originated in the poetic fancy of gentlemen on the upper levels. Sentimentalists who, observing to their distress that the ass was overladen, proposed to reform transport by putting him into the cart. A stale Christian bilge ran through their veins. They were the direct ancestors of the more saccharine liberals of today, who yet mouthed their tattered phrases and dreamed their preposterous dreams. I can find no record that these phrases, in the beginning, made much impression upon the actual objects of their rhetoric. Early democratic man seems to have given little thought to the democratic ideal, and less veneration. What he wanted was something concrete and highly materialistic. More to eat, less work, higher wages, lower taxes. He had no apparent belief in the acromatic virtue of his own class, and certainly none in its capacity to rule. His aim was not to exterminate the baron, but simply to bring the baron back to a proper discharge of baronial business. End quote. We might answer that by saying that monarchy failed to provide those concrete things that ordinary people wanted, and that's why representative government was necessary. But I think Mencken is right in that this is an unarticulated assumption about democracy, which is that democracy is the only way to get ordinary people what they want, and it's also the most efficient way to do that. And that might be true, but those are two assumptions that could be examined and possibly challenged. It's entirely possible, for example, that democracy is susceptible to corruption in a way that monarchy isn't. And I'm not arguing for monarchy, but if you have a true sovereign who has everything he needs, and his word is final, 
then it's very difficult to bribe that guy with anything. And if he feels a sense of responsibility to his people, then he will likely do what he can to make sure that they have food and what they need. The trouble is it may come up to the luck of the draw of who becomes the monarch. And if he's a good guy who's wise and shows temperance and lives a relatively modest life for a monarch and cares about his people, then that's good. And it might be a nice 30-year reign. But there have also been monarchs who were indifferent to their people, indulged in every kind of decadence that they could afford, taxed their people in order to fund those decadences. But then on the other hand, with democracy, with actual corruption or with the institutionalized and euphemistic corruption called lobbying and campaign financing, you can also get a government that while it pays lip service to the popular will, it talks about what ordinary people want. It, in a similar way, ends up funding by a more circuitous route, not the decadence of the apparent head of state or head of government, but the people who are, by various means, able to channel the flows of the public coffers into their own pockets and thereby fund their decadence at the expense of the public good, which is remarkably similar to the caricature of 16th century kings that were often given. And so that it doesn't look like I'm taking sides. I would say that this kind of corruption in a democracy can take at least two forms. One of them is the direct movement of public funds toward a company for whatever reason, defense contracting, government contracting of any kind, bloated bureaucracy, foreign aid, whatever it might be. And it can also take a route that's only slightly more infractious, which involves actually shaping the laws in a way that benefits certain parties at the expense of the public. So the irony about Mencken is that he was controversial in his day, and he's still controversial now. In fact, he's more than controversial, he would be censored now. You would be hard-pressed to find anybody in a mainstream paper criticizing democracy itself, not this party or that party, but the institution of democracy. And whenever somebody does that, some people perhaps get a little tense. And I would say, first of all, that you shouldn't do that, not because Mencken is right or because he's wrong, but it's okay if people defend positions that are outside of the orthodoxy. I think I said earlier, it's interesting that Mencken's criticism of Christianity sometimes comes off as a little bit quaint because in his day, it was more difficult to criticize Christianity and today it's relatively easy. But at the same time, his criticism of democracy probably comes across hotter for us than it did for his readers, though I'm not sure. So that might mean that it's not that we are less religious today in the 21st century. We maybe have just shifted our religion, that there's a kind of state religion. And a part of it involves a reverence for a certain form of government that maybe is justified and maybe isn't, but it's to a great extent placed beyond scrutiny. But even just looking at it a little bit, if what we really care about is the well-being of the populace and the proper use of government funds for the people, democratic government can abuse those funds in a way similar to how monarchic government can. And if somebody were to say, but look at all the gadgets that we have in our lives and how cheap clothing is and how cheap food is. And when Europe was ruled by monarchies, we didn't have any of those gadgets and everything was very expensive and people were poor. And that's a fair point, except that you can't attribute that to democracy alone. Democracy might have played a role in it, it might not have. What is certain is that the development of technology played a role in that. But technology and scientific development was rolling along the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution before democracy came to Europe. And democracy doesn't even have a claim on public education. If you listen to the episode about Alfred the Great, you have an English king in the ninth century putting a great emphasis on literacy and reading for as many people as possible. And that's over a thousand years ago. So I'm not defending monarchy, but I'm interested in this question, in the actual most efficient form of government. And I know that these kinds of questions to which many public figures have their careers staked, are so flooded with rhetoric that it's very hard to get at a clear answer. But I think it's worth it to try. And one of the prerequisites for that is a general intellectual courage, according to which you can walk down any path that you find. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stick to whatever you come up with or that it makes perfect sense, but allow yourself to think about those things. And if you find yourself sensing that you're getting toward a thought that is somehow off limits, that I would encourage you to use that feeling not as a fence, something that you move away from, but as a compass, 
something that you should go toward, not because every idea that's considered off limits by polite society is correct. There are plenty that meet that description, and I would say are certainly off limits. But this point that Mencken made earlier that every form of government has an ideology around it that justifies it and thereby protects it is certainly true. And it's possible that you have been taught something very foundational in your worldview that is actually not in your interest or in the interest of the people you care about, but is in the interest of the people who are trying to, as they say, govern you. And that sense that something is off limits might actually be a curtain to conceal something from you that would actually benefit you a lot. Later, he makes an interesting observation about political history. He says of the Tsar of Russia, and he's talking about Nicholas II, whom the Bolsheviks overthrew in 1917. And he mentions the establishment of the Duma, which is actually in 1905, so much earlier. Quote, he signed his own death warrant when he signed the decree calling the first Duma. Even if a world war had never come, he would have lost its throne inevitably, and his head with it. So in many another case, ancient and modern. There has never been a successful revolution out of the clear sky. Always the doomed despot has prepared for it by making concessions to his enemies. The psychology behind this phenomenon is so simple that even a psychoanalyst should be able to penetrate it. What protects the despot, so as long as he lays about him boldly, is the fact that very few men, even among rebels, have any appreciable courage. Whether physically or morally, they seldom attack a power that can really hurt them and is plainly willing and eager to do so. But the moment that power shows any sign of fading into weakness, they become very daring and are hot for defying it. Next to outright abdication, the chief sign of such weakening, at least to most men, is a readiness to compromise. They have no belief whatever in the excuses commonly given for it. Generosity, a sense of justice, conversion to new ideas, and so on. They always see it, and perhaps quite rightly, as simply a cloak of fear. Thus the despot who hedges, no matter how exalted his motives may be in his own view, appears to his enemies as one who has lost his grip, and at the first chance they fly at his throat, usually to the tune of loud protestations of altruism. The leaders among them appear suddenly to be full of courage, for courage is always a relative matter, and the man who runs from a lion in the full possession of its faculties will pull the tail of a lion down with the palsy. Simultaneously, the camp followers and me too's hitherto discreetly silent, begin to beat heroically on wash tubs and to demand a chance to get at him, end quote. And that's a great comment, both on a dynamic of political history, of which I do not think it would be too difficult to find other examples, and on a dynamic of psychology that's at play in that kind of political context, which is that even rebels are afraid of what they're opposing. But the moment that their opponent shows weakness, they feel more brave the people who are actively opposing it, and also the people who are on the sidelines passively or silently opposing it are encouraged to make themselves known. That's the kind of thing that, on the one hand, would be hard to demonstrate, even if you had a string of historical examples that fit this mold, where first an embattled leader gave a concession and then he was overthrown. Even if you had a bunch of examples like that, it still would not demonstrate that that psychological narrative best explains what's going on. It might be explained in some other way. But on the other hand, that does seem very plausible, that that dynamic at least plays a role in that pattern of events. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again, because many people are under the delusion that if you read something, or if you repeat it, or if you want to discuss it, it's because you agree with it somehow. But I am not a Milton Friedman free market capitalist. And my sense from reading Mencken is that he would not have been either. Friedman was 32 years younger than him. And the discussion in Mencken's time was framed differently than it was during the Cold War. But you can see elements of it starting to take shape in these earlier conversations. And if you do really like Friedman's ideas, then that's fine too. You don't need my permission, but I hope you won't go running away just because we might disagree on certain things. I'll read the passage first and then we can talk about it. Quote, The extraordinary progress of the world since the Middle Ages has not been due to the mere expenditure of human energy, nor even to the flights of human genius. For men had worked hard since the remotest times, and some of them had been of surpassing intellect. No, it has been due to the accumulation of capital. That accumulation permitted labor to be organized economically and on a large scale, and thus greatly enhanced its productiveness. It provided the machinery that gradually diminished human drudgery and liberated the spirit of the worker, who had formerly been almost indistinguishable from a mule. Most of all, it made possible a longer and better preparation for work, so that every art and handicraft greatly widened its scope and range, and multitudes of new and highly complicated crafts came in." End quote. And I'm very interested in these big questions about 
how history turned out how it did. And here, Mencken is arguing that capital, accumulated surplus, is what made civilization what it is. Sometimes he criticizes civilization, but here he appears to be using it as a proof of the good effects of capitalism. And the more I think about this, without being an ideological capitalist, there's certainly something here. Artists and musicians don't like to acknowledge that pretty much every great artist and every great musician until the 20th century had a patron. And a patron was somebody who had enough capital stored up that they could give away some of it to sustain an artist or a musician while they worked on their art. And another thing that Mencken touches on there is how capitalism allowed for longer periods of training and increasingly specialized knowledge, for example, in scientific fields requires increasingly elaborate training to become a practitioner. And one thing that you don't do while you're learning is make money, really. But it's also very necessary that learning happen. It's very good for civilization that people learn things, depending on what it is that they learn. And capital, even if it's your father's little bit of wealth that he built up so you could go study wherever in the 19th century, allows for that more expanded training to take place, which then allows for the development of more knowledge. So it looks like Mencken might be generally correct, though again, this is the kind of question that's very difficult to answer exhaustively, but we can look at it logically in a superficial way and see if it makes sense. But I would say that capital is a prerequisite of civilization. Mencken says, quote, we owe to it almost everything that passes under the general name of civilization today, end quote. I would say that at that curtain call, it's not just capitalism that gets to take a bow. You have concentrated wealth in other places in history. You have it in Babylon, you have it in Assyria, you have it in the Muslim Middle East, starting from the 8th century or so, the Abbasids. Much earlier, you have it in Sumer and Elam and the Indus Valley, and you have it in Greece and Rome as well. You have accumulated wealth. So why did this explosive flowering of civilization that's been going on over the last 700 years in Europe not happen in any of those places? And yes, I know about Al-Kindi, Al-Khwarizmi, Omar Hayyam, Ibn Al-Haytham, all those guys, lots of very important Arab and Muslim contributions to mathematics and other things. And we can do the same thing with the Greeks. Obviously, the list is much longer. And Rome is not as easy on the scientific side, but there's a lot of important literature and law and military concepts that came out of Rome that are significant. And we could do the same with these other examples of what might be called a false start in civilization. Like a fire was lit, but then it burned itself out. Why, if the Middle East was ahead of Europe in certain ways in the ninth century, was it not able to maintain that lead thereafter? If capital caused civilization the way that rain causes plants to grow, then the oldest place where accumulated wealth appeared should today be the most civilized place. That's not the case, and the explanation has to be some other component or a set of components, at least one of which I think has to be the memes that a civilization is operating under. In the case of the Middle East, I think that Al-Ghazali's occasionalism, this idea which appeared in Christianity also, that nothing causes anything else, God causes all of it, that if you set something on fire and you see it burn, it is an unjustified logical and philosophical leap to assume that the fire is causing the stick to be consumed. All you know is that they're contemporaneous. They're both happening at the same time, but you cannot argue that one is causing the other. In fact, God is causing the burning and the fire is just there as an isolated thing that cannot affect anything. Scholars now call this idea occasionalism and adopt it at the societal or civilizational level. It's easy to see how this would kill scientific inquiry, which is to a great extent an investigation of cause and effect. And if your explanation for everything is that God is the only cause, and more importantly, if it's heretical to oppose that idea, at least for the most thoughtful people in the society, for the theologians in 10th or 11th century Iraq, if they are discouraged by a meme like this, from investigating cause and effect, then it's easy to see how, in the long term, this will orient the trajectory of a civilization downward, or at least inhibiting its ascent. And if you were to say, who cares what the theological doctrine is, that's just what the theologians are thinking, you should remember that many of the early scientists in medieval Europe were monks and priests. Roger Bacon, Jean Bourdin, Copernicus, Marine Marsan, there's a lot of them. So if the Muslim clergy are discouraged in their spare time from tinkering with questions about the natural world, 
in the way that the clergy in Europe were not, then in a certain sense, the cake might have been baked in the 11th century. And you can also throw in that the monastery as an institution is far less common in Islam than it is in Christianity. There are Sufi lodges and things in Islam, and Muslims will argue that this is a strength of the religion that they say in the Quran where it says, come to prayer on Friday, it says something like, leave your business, set your work aside and come to prayer, and then you can go back afterwards. It assumes that you are in the world. You're not up on a mountaintop somewhere or in a monastery. You are mixing it up in ordinary life and that the religion is stronger because of that. And that's fine. It's a different meme, but... It means that there's less room for the development of a monastery, and by extension, you have fewer guys sitting by themselves in a room contemplating the divine, and eventually some of them start to ask some questions about acoustics or how the planets move or biology or whatever it might be. And then after that, you throw in how Bayezid II, Ottoman Sultan, late 15th century, banned the printing of books, and this ban was upheld for 250 years, and these memes start to stack up whether they be a cultural practice like printing books or not, or an intellectual belief about cause and effect, and you can readily trace the effects in the civilization that results. So if you feel your ideological quills stand up when Mencken proposes a connection between capital and civilization, I would encourage you to overcome that reaction, not because Mencken is necessarily correct, or even partially correct, but responding with an ideological reflex is no way to go about answering any question. And even if it gets you a good answer once or twice, it will eventually and dramatically fail you. There are other passages that I wanted to show you, but if you liked what Mencken has to say, I recommend you pick up a copy of this or another collection of his writings. These would be fine to have somewhere in the house where you could just browse them a little bit sometimes when you're sitting in the evening resting. Since many of them were written for the newspaper, they're relatively short and you could read one or two of them without committing too much time. And if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, I hope you will send it to a thoughtful friend who you think would benefit from it and go over to my website, volrathpublishing.com. The link is in the description and pick up a copy of my edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I have it at a good price with free shipping, original cover art, excellent print quality, 97 footnotes throughout the book. And by ordering a copy, you will be supporting independent book publishing a practice that I do not think is valuable because I do it, but rather I do it because I think it's valuable. Farewell until next time. Take care and happy reading.